So I wanted to talk tonight or preach tonight about the subject of prophesying to begin with, but really what is the purpose of prophesying? It's to edify the church. And that is the topic uh, tonight, the edification of the church. And we'll get into that in a minute, but I did want to go over 1 Corinthians 14 and just talk about this subject of prophesying, what it is and what it isn't. So it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So, of course, he's talked earlier about all these different gifts, how there's many different things that people can do, but he's saying that they should desire, most of all, that they would prophesy. It goes on and says, For he that spoke, speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and to comfort. So why is it that they should desire to prophesy? They should desire to prophesy uh, so that they could speak unto men to edify and to exhort and to comfort. He goes on in verse 4 and says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Again, he's putting the emphasis not on tongues, but on prophesying, because prophesying is what's going to edify the body of Christ. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speak with, speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that he may that the church may receive edifying, saying, look, there's nothing wrong with tongues as long one, as somebody interprets the tongues, and then the church is edified. And of course, this isn't the thrust of the message, message but we understand that tongues are not what modern, you know, the Pentecostals today would call tongues, the babbling, the incoherent speaking. But it's very clear in Scripture that tongues are actually speaking in an un a, a foreign language, a language that you have not learned. And you see that in Acts and elsewhere. We're not going to go into that tonight. But he's saying here, What's more important than speaking with tongues is prophesying. And the tongues are only beneficial unless somebody interprets it, unless it's understood by the church what is said, because only then is what, said, uh, what is said is edifying to the church. So the, edif the, 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 the emphasis that Paul is putting here in 1 Corinthians 14 is the edification of the church. So prophesying here is how he's, he is saying that that is to be done. He would he'd rather people prophesy than speak in tongues. Now, prophesying, that's not something that we, that's not a term we use a lot today. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, prophesying is preaching. Now, I will say it is a, it is a, a form of preaching. You know, it's somebody would be speaking, you know, the words of God. But I don't think it's the preaching that we mean today. I think that's, that's something different. It's not, prophesying is not preaching in the sense that we would think of it today. Like what I'm doing right now, I would not consider prophesying. And let me explain why. And that's simply because of the fact, and if you would go over to keep something in 1 Corinthians 14, go over to Mark 14. Mark 14. Prophesying is a foretelling of the future. That's what that is. And then that's many times in the scripture, that's what you see it as. Simply somebody telling something that, uh, that, that is about to come to pass. I'll remind us of 1 Kings chapter 22, when Ahab convinced Jehoshaphat to go up with them to war, and they called for the prophets. And the prophets, you know, lied to him. And Jehoshaphat says to him, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that may, we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imlah, by whom we inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Saying, so why doesn't he like him? Because he prophesies not good, but evil. So he's going to give us an example of prophesying in the scripture and that's exactly what Mah Micaiah does. He goes in, in, uh, on in verse uh, 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? So he's asking him, tell us what we should do. What is the future? Prophesy to us, is what he's saying here. And the king said unto him, uh, and, he, and he said, and he answered, go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And of course, Jehoshaphat knows better. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? He's saying, Look, I know who you are. I know how you preach. And you're saying the exact same thing as all these other guys. I, I, something tells me you're holding back. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep having not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. He says, Actually, you know what? If, you're, if you really want to know what, what's going to happen, you shouldn't go to war. You should go back. And what was he doing there? What was Micaiah doing for Jehoshaphat? He was telling him what was about to come to pass. He was telling him things that had not come to pass already. He was prophesying. He was telling the future. He was foretelling things. Prophesying is, you know, not only foretelling the future, but it's also stating that which one could not otherwise know. 
stating that which one could not other not otherwise know. It's a supernatural thing. I'll, I'll remind us of Matthew chapter 26 where it says, when of course this is when the Pharisees had taken Christ and, and, and began to mock him and it says that they spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is it that smote thee? They're not saying preach. They're not saying get up and tell us a message. They're saying prophesy. Who is it that smote thee? You're saying, why would they ask him that question? Well, look in Mark chapter 14. It says in verse 65, And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him. So they put a blindfold on him when they're smacking him, and they're saying, prophesy, tell us who it is that smote thee. How else could he know? He had no way of knowing who it was. I mean, albeit he was God, but they didn't, they didn't know that. They didn't believe that anyway. And so they're saying, prophesy, tell us something that you could not otherwise know. Do something supernatural. And they're mocking him, of course. There's an example of this. I've already kind of alluded to it in the announcements about the, about the, uh, you know, the, the sign-up sheet, Ananias and Sapphira, right? In Acts chapter 5, a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira sold the possession and kept back the part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay? Now, he's saying his wife was privy to it, meaning nobody else knew about it, but Ananias and Sapphira, they're the only two people that knew that they were up to. But Peter, and Ananias, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the ghost that, and to keep back the part of the land? While it remained, not, was it not thine own? And afterwards it sold, was it not in thine power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? And hast, thou hast not lied unto God, unto men, but unto God. And of course, I, Ananias falls down. What's, and what's Peter doing here? He's prophesying. He's telling him something that he, you know, otherwise would have no ability to know because he's been giving a supernatural ability to tell Ananias exactly what's taking place. Just like Micaiah could tell Jehoshaphat what was going to come to pass. Just like the Jews were tempting Christ to do. They wanted them to prophesy. Now it says here in 1 Corinthians if you would go back to 1 Corinthians 14, keep something there, go back one chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul said that prophesying would be done away. That it would disappear. Okay? He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. He's saying, look, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what was in part? The prophesying. That's the previous verse in verse 9. For we know in part, there's things that we know, we understand, and then we prophesy in part. <coughs> and he says, but that which is perfect, when that which is complete is come, then that which is in part, the prophesying, shall be done away. Now, of course, to kind of understand the context here, and I've heard different interpretations of this, but I believe what he's referring to here is the Word of God. He's saying, look, we know in part. Now, what part did they have back then? They had the Old Testament. You know, this it might come as a shock, but they didn't have the New Testament in Paul's day, right? Because <laughs> he hadn't written it yet. You know, that was how, that's who it came from was them. So they knew in part, they had the Old Testament, but then they also prophesied in part. And that's how you receive the Old Testament, or the New Testament, rather. <coughs> And he's saying, look, when that which is perfect has come, when we've spoken the word of God, when these epistles have been written, when God has done completing his word, then that which is in part prophesying shall be done away. So do we have the complete word of God today? We do. So is prophesying done away? I believe that it is because prophesying, as I understand it, is not preaching. I believe it's something different. Now, I will say that prophesying serves the same end as preaching. And what was the whole purpose behind prophesying in 1 Corinthians 14? The edification of the local church. So today we don't necessarily prophesy, although if you wanted to call it that, I wouldn't you know, make a big stink about that. But I would just call it preaching because I think prophesying the Bible is something different. But some people say, oh, he's just talking about preaching. And I, I see where they're coming from because they both serve the same end, to edify the body in Christ. <laughs> Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. I mean, it's almost verbatim what Paul told Timothy to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He that speaketh an unknown tongue to edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So prophesying, preaching, though I don't believe they're the same thing, serve the same end to edify the body of Christ. Go over to, uh, go over to Ephesians chapter four. Actually, you know what? Go over to First Thessalonians five. First Thessalonians five. 1 Thessalonians 5. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave a gift, gifts unto men. It's about when Christ ascended into heaven, it says that he gave gifts unto men. Okay? And he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and he gave some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for what? What was the purpose behind, for, uh, for uh, what was the purpose of Christ giving these gifts? And giving the, uh, these gifts unto man and giving apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. What was the point of that? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man. So the offices of apostle and prophets are just like prophesying. Do we still have prophets and apostles in the, in the biblical sense, the biblical definition? Do we have prophets who are the ones that prophesy today? We don't. Now, you could say that a preacher is a type of a prophet, and I would agree with you, but I believe there is an actual thing called a prophet in the Old Testament, and what he did was prophesy, okay? And just like today, just like in, the, in, in Paul's day and Christ's day, there were apostles, and there was a very select group of people, you know, and that's a whole other sermon right there, what qualifies an apostle? I believe it's somebody who saw the miracles of Christ, and of course, believed on Christ, and saw the resurrected Christ as well. That was, there was a criteria there, okay? We don't have those today. I don't care what the apostolic church says. Yeah. None of those people have seen the risen Christ. Right. They're liars. Okay, The offices of the apostles and prophets no longer exist. Just like prophesying is not something that we do today. Just like tongues is something that has gone away. Just like certain gifts have seen, so have these offices. <clears throat> and you say, well, what's the point of this? What are you getting at? What I'm getting at is that, you know, it's true that the gift of prophesying has gone away, but we still have preaching, don't we? We still have the means by which to edify the body of Christ. Now, the apostles and the, and the prophets, they're done away. But we still have teachers and we still have preachers today, right? To do the same end. The evangelists, the pastors and teachers to perfect the body of the saints. So here's what I'm getting at is that the work has not gotten lighter. The load has not gotten lighter on that which remains. It's actually gotten heavier. Because now you have less means by which to do it, right? We don't have the prophesying. We don't have the apostles anymore. We don't have the prophets. Now it's a, it's a smaller group of people that have been given the exact same work to do. And it's, it's, much a, it's a bigger work. There's more people that need to be edified today than in Paul's day. <laughs> that makes that which remains, the preachers, the teachers, the evangelists, all the more important, all the more necessary. The job of the edifying of the church still needs to be done. Are you there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Look at verse 11. And this is what I want to get at tonight, you know, and it doesn't just fall all on the preacher to edify the body. He says here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And that's the title of the sermon tonight. That was all introduction right there, but edify one another. And I went through all that to explain all that just to lead up to this point, that the, the, the edifying of the body of Christ is something that still has to happen today, we, have, we don't have more people to do it. You know, we have less. We have less offices by which to do that. It's still a big job. And you know what? It doesn't fall all on just the preachers, the teachers, and the evangelists, and the pastors. It also falls on the body itself. The, you know, I mean, Paul's telling them here, edify one another. And that's what I want to encourage everyone in this church to do, to edify one another. Don't just leave it up to one person to get up and edify you. You know, we need to have other people that are capable of edifying the body of Christ. And, you know, there's different ways in which we could do that. But I'm trying to get at the point here is that it's the job of everyone to edify one another. You know, I kinda, and this kind of ties in with this, this morning's sermon a little bit behind the law of kindness, you know, being long-suffering, so on and so forth. And I can re-preach all that. But that would be one way to edify one another, wouldn't it? And it's everyone's job to edify one another. And I call it a job because it's, it's work. <laughs> That's one thing I've learned in the last, you know, however long I've been doing, a year and a half, whatever it's been, is that getting up and trying to edify the body of Christ is not always the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. To know what people need to hear, know what people should hear. You know, I, we were talking about it this morning. You know, it's a lot funner to just get up here and just rip on fags the whole time. You know, I could do that every Sunday and have, have a grand old time, especially with everything that's going on with Ellen DeGenerate right now. Yeah. I mean, let me just take a break. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you see how easily I could just start going off. You know, mass is coming, you know. Look out, Ellen, you degenerate. <coughs> I'm glad she showed up my news feed because I got give me a topic. And I, I would love to just go off on that. We'd love to just preach about, you know, all these different topics and things that people, you know, were entertained by. We love. We, it's good. We'd like to hear it. 
But does that always edify the body? Is that really what you're going to need to walk out of here and live a successful Christian life just to hear me rail and rant about Ellen Degenerate? You know, we can get together after church if you really, you really want. I, believe me, I have some thoughts that I would be more than happy to express to you. But that's, you know, it's, it takes work to get up and to actually try to edify the body to figure out what is it that people really need to hear. What is it that's actually going to help them in the long haul to live the Christian life? It's a job. And you know what? It's not just my job. It's everybody's job. And look there in verse 12. He says, And beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. He's saying, look, what is the labor of them? What is it that they're doing with this laboring? It's edifying. And who are over in the Lord and admonish you. You know, that's the preaching. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And I'm not just up here trying to blow my own horn, get, blow my own horn or, you know, get you know you know validate my position or something like that but i'm just telling you that you know i've come to learn and have even more respect for the men of god in my life the people that have preached to me the word of god the people that have labored among me in the past the uh, pastor anderson and others you know that i've since taking on this role have o even only more respect for these people because now i understand even more how hard it really is to know what it is that ought to be preached and to really edify a body Again, the positions may be fewer, but the job isn't any smaller. It's still a big job. There might be no more apostles. There might be no more prophets. There might be no more prophesying. You know, I'm not just going to get up here and, and have the Spirit take over and give me some utterance. Okay. I'm actually going to have to get into the Word of God and read it and study it and know it and sit down and actually type it out and print it out. You know, not just the words, but how the words are organized. What font to use, how many spaces, so on and so forth, so I can actually read my own sermon. And have a, actually have a coherent, you know, line of thought. So that it would actually do what? Edify the body. Okay? <coughs> that job isn't easy and the job hasn't gotten any smaller. And I'll say this, you know, is that preaching is not the only way to edify one another. You know, we could do, you don't have to have, I'm not the only one in the room that has to do it. You know, you got, and I'm sure people do that. In fact, I know people in this church do that. That they go to one another, they encourage one another. They have relationships outside of the day. They get together outside of church times and they, they hang out together and they you know, encourage each other in the Lord and to live for the Lord and so on and so forth and how to you know, be a, a godly wife and mother, how to be a godly man, how to be a godly husband and father. People get together and they learn these things not only just from talking to one another but often even just from observing one another. You know, sometimes you don't even have to try to edify somebody. You know, you're just living your life, doing the best, living for the Lord, and somebody's watching you, and whether you even know it or not, you're edifying them, you're helping them, you're building them up in their own faith just by your example. It's not just the preaching that does it. How you live your life can edify people. But on the flip side, you know, on the same token, it can also discourage somebody if you think about it. Right. You know, you could also be very discouraging to people. And that's not the thrust of the sermon, but how you live your life can edify people. Now go over to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. <coughs> so preaching is not the only way to edify each other. How you live your life will also edify one another. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. He's saying, look, there's a lot of things that I can do that you know, are not going to be sinful. They're, all, they're lawful for me to do. But are they expedient? Meaning, are they you know, necessary? Are they... Uh, is it something I should be doing because it's expedient? Is this actually going to help in any way, shape, or form? Just because you can do something doesn't always necessarily mean you should. All things are lawful, uh, lawful for me, but all things edify not. You know, there's some things we could do that, you know, the, the others in church could watch us do and we could say, well, it's not sinful, but you know what? It doesn't edify. It's not building us up. Look here in Romans chapter 14. Of course, he goes into talking about you know, the eating of meat sacrificed unto idols and how it would cause some men to stumble. To see a man who is professing Christ then partake of meat that has been sacrificed to another. A weaker brother might see that and say, well, why? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you said the Lord God was, was the, tr the true and living God. And now I see you eating this meat. And he's saying, look, we know an idol is nothing. And we know that meat is nothing. And it's, but he's saying, look, all things might be lawful, but, you know, if that meat is going to cause my brother to stumble, then I shall no, eat no meat while the world standeth. Look at Romans 14, verse 12. He says this, So then every one of us shall give us an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another in, in, any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 
You know, one way you could really edify your, your brethren in Christ is to make sure you're not going to put a stumbling block in front of them. That you're not going to do something or say something or be something that's going to cause them to stumble and fall out. And you say, well, that's on them. That's their fault. Yeah, but some people come into church and, you know, everyone starts out as a babe. And, and, and some people, you know, think about how a babe learns to walk. I mean, I've got one that's almost two years old and she still hasn't let go of the furniture yet. You know, some kids are late bloomers. Right? But they don't just stand, they're not like horses. You know, horses, they give birth or giraffes or whatever, these four, these quadrupeds, right? I hope I cite that right, that are born and just within hours, they're running around, galloping, you know, because they have to, because of, you know, survival and things like that. Kids, you know, are different. You know, they take months, sometimes even years, to learn how to walk, right? <laughs> We're not concerned. But, uh, <laughs> but my, I'm using it as an analogy, it's the same way in the Christian life. Not every Christian who gets saved and walks into a church like this is just going to hit the ground, saying all the right things, doing all the right things, reading the Bible, there at all the church service, doing the soul winning, and just have all the answers and have it all put together. And if we're not careful, you know, if we, if we start to judge them over that or have a condescending attitude, you know, we could actually cause that person to stumble. And then he's saying, look, that's one way to, that's one way to edify your brethren is to not be a stumbling block to them, but rather to be a support. He said in verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy him not with thy meat, for whom Christ died. He said, look, we know it's nothing. We can eat the meat. We understand, you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and that an idol is nothing. It's vain, it's dumb, it's stupid. We're just hungry, we just want to eat the meat. You know, I can go into Rainbow Donuts at 35th Avenue and, uh, and, and, and the, what is it, 35th Avenue and whatever road it is, and, <laughs> and walk in and buy 12 dozen donuts and look right at their stupid little statue, their little Buddha with the, the you know, the donut, the half a donut and a <laughs> six-day-old cup of coffee next to it. And I can take that same box of donuts and, and bring it to church and say, hey, enjoy, right. because we know that that stupid, you know, idol is nothing. Well, you know what, if a guy walked in here and said, well, was this sacrifice to idols? Although I don't think those specific donuts were. You know, <laughs> let's pretend they were. You know, and he was offended when he saw us, you know, a you know, bunch of cream and just, you know, going at it. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, what Paul is saying is put the donut down, friend. Right. You know, put the donuts away. If it's going to cause a person that is weak in the faith to stumble, you know, edify your brother that way by not putting a stumbling block and not giving him an occasion to fall. <laughs> he says here, destroy him not with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Why should, we, why should we try to edify the body? Why should we not cause them to stumble? Because that same person is somebody else that Christ died for. Let not your, your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I got some of you second-guessing heaven on radio, don't you? It's not meat and drink. What are you talking about, Brother Corbin? <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, stupid joke. But he goes on in verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another. You know, instead of saying, get over yourself, it's just a donut. You know, it's just meat sacrificed on an idol. Let's put that away and help that brother in Christ, that sister in Christ to grow and to edify them. He said in verse 20, for meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eateth with offense. <clears throat> it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So again, how you live your life will edify the brethren. And how you live your life can also discourage the brethren. The things that you do and say, the example you are can make or break some people. And you say, well, that's not fair. That's on them. Well, that's just the way it is because they're weak. And if it's, you know, and he's saying here, look, if, if they're offended, you know, don't put anything in their way that's going to cause them to, to, be, uh, to, be, to stumble, to be offended, or made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. You know, it'd be better to just take that donut and go eat alone. <laughs> you know, go, so, well, just let me not see that me doing this. You know, and enjoy the donut. <laughs> you know, and not condemn yourself in the thing that you allow. Hopefully you could take the donut example and apply it elsewhere, <laughs> Okay. You're not just going to use that one. Well, he said we could eat donuts, right? <laughs> and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, but he, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. 
We then that are strong, verse chapter 15, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. It all comes back to that again. You know, that we that are strong, we that are mature in the Lord, we should edify the, brought the body, we should edify one another by not putting a stumbling block in their way. And if they're offended by something that we're doing and we say, well, it's not sinful, but if it's going to cause them to stumble, you know what? It'd be better just to, to, to set that aside. You know, it's lawful, but is it expedient? Is it going to help another grow? Or are we going to condemn ourselves in the thing which we allow? And maybe we could come back to that later when that, you know, brother or sister in Christ has the understanding, has the maturity, has grown to a place where they understand, oh, now I see why that is allowed, why you can do that, why that is lawful. You could come back to it later, maybe. <coughs> so he's saying here, basically, we should act in a way that will edify one another. You know, I started out saying, you know, the, ed the edification of the church is a big job. It's hard. There's a lot to do. And it's not just all in the preacher. It's not just the, the preacher's job to get up. Now, of course, that is his job, to get up and edify the body, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. But we can't say that it's entirely his job to edify the body. The, the church also has to edify itself in love. <clears throat> we should act in a way that will edify one, one another. So let me give you some practical examples, very down-to-earth, very simple examples. How about coming to church? You want to edify your brother in Christ? How about show up at the service? Oh, I mean, like regularly. Become a fixture in church. You know, I know I'm kind of, it's Sunday night and I'm preaching to the choir. You know, maybe I should have preached it this morning. <laughs> you know, where, where, where are the brethren? I mean, it would be more edifying if there were more, and I get it, not everybody can be here. People's schedules and conflicts and things like that. I'm not saying you have to be here every single time, but... I am saying, you know, you should be known as somebody who's faithful to church. Why? Because that will edify the body. Right. Not only will the person who shows up be edified by the preaching, but just your presence alone, just sitting in a chair and staring at the preacher is going to edify your, bro your, your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ, because you're there. You know, and I, you know, I, don't, I really don't need it, you know, to, to, to feel like what I'm doing is important. I'll preach to one of you. And some of you know I mean that because I've preached to like two or three of you, <laughs> right? And I have preached to one guy before, you know, and it was, I probably told the story already. Up at Faithful Word North, you know, I would show up 8 a.m. in the morning. It was our service time up there so we could make it back to 1030 service in, down in, in Tempe. So I'm up there at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning and I had a policy. I said, if no one's there, I'm going to do the songs, the announcements, and then I'm going to wait 15 minutes to see if anybody shows up. And I was in the second song, singing to myself, just blah, acapella, acapella. Nobody in the, in the thing. And the guy walks in and he sees me singing and he looks around and he's just like, <laughs> and I just smile at him and I just keep right on singing. I, just, I think I even kind of went, like, have a seat. And I just kept right on going, went through the announcement, sang another song with him and then preached a service. Amen. <laughs> What I'm saying is this, that when you show up to church, you know, now, would, would I have been more edified, more encouraged, and, and more excited if we had a full house that morning? Yeah, sure. But I'll edify one person. I'm saying that one way you can edify the body in Christ is to be a part of the body of Christ. To just show up. Don't think it's just, oh, you know, I don't need it. You know, there's probably plenty of people that have grown in their faith that, could, that can go without church. They don't necessarily have to have church in order to survive as a Christian, that they're still going to live for God and read their Bibles and do the soul winning and praying and everything, that uh, all the other things that make up the Christian life, that they could probably be just fine, you know, indefinitely without church. You know, you don't need that, uh, you know, you, the same spirit which anointeth you can teach you all things. You need not that any man teacheth you. There's nothing you can't learn with the Bible and the Holy Spirit that, I, that, you know, that, that I'll teach you. You can learn it on your own, is what I'm trying to say. But you know what? what? It would be beneficial to the body even if that person who's so mature in their faith would just show up and just be here and be a part of the church and edify one another. I mean, I'm sure everybody in the room feels the same way. I'm sure those, those two or three people that I preached to that one night down here would have preferred to have a room full of people because it feels like, man, there's really something going on here. Now, of course, there's something going on either way. But doesn't it feel like there's, there's more going on when there's more people involved? Right. When you're in a big church, when you got a full house. <clears throat> um, so that's one way you can, the church can edify itself. By being in church, showing up, getting to church. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. 
And let us consider one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, that's a very familiar passage. Anytime you talk about church attendance, you go to Hebrews chapter 10 and preach this. But it says there, consider one another. Not consider yourself. Not just consider, well, I need to be in church for my sake. Consider everybody else around you. Consider the brethren. Consider the other people that are in your church that you would edify just by being there. That when they see you faithful, they say, well, I'm, he's faithful. You know, she's faithful. I'm going to be faithful too. Amen. That would encourage somebody. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So he's saying here, you know, hold fast the profession of your faith. Are we doing that? Are we edifying the body? Are we holding fast the profession of our faith or are we just kind of ho-hum about church? Yeah, and I can make it, I'll make it, you know, but... You know, and I understand that things come up. But if you're just staying out of church because you're just lazy, that's not good. And it's sin. And actually, it's sinful to do that. And that's a whole other subject in and of itself. He said, well, you know, you're just, you, just, you just want people in church so you can feel like a big shot or something. No, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. The Bible says in Ephesians, I'll just read to you. It says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You know why I think it's important to be in church? Because this is the institution that Christ gave himself for. Yeah. That God gave himself for. Christ. It says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. I want to be a part of something that God gave himself for. And I want that for other people. I think you should be in church because that's what God... Uh, it says in, in Acts chapter 20, God... Uh, feed the church of God which, uh, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I mean, think about the price that was paid for church. And I'm not just talking about rent. I'm talking about the blood of Christ was shed so that we could get together and edify one another in Christ. That was the price that was paid. In order to edify one another, here, you know, get in church, how about this, and participate in the program. Look, just showing up is great. Just being there in church, that's going to edify people. How about participating in the program? And again, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know that. Go soul winning. I mean, what is this church's program? Soul winning. What else have you got? Oh, well, we got, we got soul winning on Saturday. And we got soul winning on a Sunday. You got anything else? Yeah, we got soul winning on Thursday. <laughs> I mean, we got soul winning, soul winning, more soul winning. And as the church grows and there's more you know, availability and, and, and resources and things, you know what other programs we're going to add? More soul winning. <laughs> There's going to be soul winning to the res trips when they own, uh, the reservations when they own up, open up. There's other things that we can do as, as things open up. You know, participate in the program. And in case you haven't heard, that program is soul winning. That's what we're about. And you say, well, it's hot. And those of us that were out, at, who have been out over the last several weeks, you know, and even yay, months, no, it's hot. It's hot. I mean, hottest July ever recorded in, 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 in Phoenix. But here's the thing. I bet if it meant a million bucks, you could do it. I bet if I said there's a suitcase here at a million dollars, and if you go soul winning today, it's yours. You, I mean, you're going to go out there and feel like, a, you know, like, you're, like you're in the Antarctic. You're going to think, oh, man, this weather's perfect because there's a million bucks. Now, fortunately for me, all it takes is a couple of respondos for you guys. <laughs> you know, if there's, a, if there's a Macedonia waiting for you at Sonoran and Delights, you're there, right? <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. And you know what? Even if you didn't have that, I know people in this church who would go out because they love souls and they're willing to do that. <laughs> so participate in the program of the church. And I'm just trying to encourage us today you know, to, to, to edify one another. And these are just some practical ways we can do it. You know, it's not just all my job to get up and do the edification. Now, is that a huge part of my job? Of course it is. I understand that. But let's not just get an attitude of, well, you know, that's, that's the preacher's job. We should be conscious and thinking, how can I help another brother or sister in Christ? What can I do to encourage them? What can I do to help them grow in Christ or be you know, a help to them, a blessing to them? You know, and I've watched this happen in this church, and it's been a blessing to me to just sit back you know, after service and see people getting together, ladies talking about things, guys getting together and fellowshipping, and people are helping one another even outside of our regular you know, service times. And that's, what is that? That's the body edifying itself. So I'm not, you know, this isn't like a harping sermon, like you need to fix this. I just want more of the same. Yeah. You know, I just want to see that continue because that's really important. That's something, because again, it's a big job that one man can't do on his own. It's not, this church isn't going to be built just by me, just by me being me. 
You know, it's going to take you being you in Christ. And of course, it's going to take the Lord. But here's another one I want to touch on before we wrap this up here. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter sermon, I think. But how about this? Be willing to preach if needed. Be willing to preach if needed. You know, I recently asked a guy, um, not here, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to have opportunities coming up to preach in Tucson. Do you want to do it? Yeah, I'll do it, but, you know, I only want to do one service at a time. I was like, you know, it's like, and this is, and I'm not trying to bash the guy. You know, he came around and saw my perspective. But this is an attitude that I just, you know, we shouldn't have of this. He said, I want to just dip my toe in it and see what it's like. I said, no, buddy, you need to do a cannonball. I mean, you need to, you need to belly flop into the preaching. I mean, you need to just go down there, both services, do the soul wedding, and you just, just, you know, take that thing by the horns. You know, and I would encourage the men in this room as well. You know, any of the men in here that desire to preach or have, have done any, you know, the guys in the preaching class, other people have already, have already filled the pulpit before. Are you ready to do that again? Because I'm telling you, it's, you think that'll never happen, and then it does. And then I do have to make that call. Hey, there's a, you know, there's a wreck on the 10. I'm not going to be there. It's shut down for, you know, <laughs> I'm an hour behind now. You know, or whatever. You know, have a blowout. Some kid starts throwing up. Or who knows, you know? Any number of things could happen on an hour and a half journey down here on a Sunday morning. The question is, are you willing and able and ready to edify the body? Or is it just my job only? Or am I the only one that should be ready, willing, and able to do that? And you say, well, I don't know. It just makes me nervous. Tell me about it. <laughs> you think I'm not, I'm nervous. At, you know, I'll just confess my, I don't want to even say it's a fault, but I'll just tell you right now, I'm nervous before every single service down here, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> you know, I get, the, I get the knots in my guts and, you know, and I, here's what I tell guys when they ask me about nerves. They say, well, wh you know, what do you do to stop being nervous? I'm like, you don't, you know. I asked Pastor Anderson, you know, what do you, I say the same question. And he was just like, well, you got to preach about thousand sermons. <laughs> <laughs> there's your answer just preach a thousand sermons and then you'll, you'll, you'll be more at ease and you know what the more you preach the more at ease you do get but what I've noticed so far is that you just get used to being nervous you say up oh, my hands are my palms are sweaty again my, I'm sweating on my brow I'm having a hard time breathing my diaphragm's constricting I'm my, you know I'm getting tunnel vision yeah. I can't think straight I don't even know what I'm trying to say up here anymore <laughs> everyone's staring at me you know the voice shakes, so on and so forth. I get it, right? But that's just part of learning to preach. That's just part of going through it. And I don't care how nervous a guy is. If you get up and preach the word of God, you're going to edify the body. Amen. Because it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about whoever behind the pulpit. It's about the Bible. Preach the word. Amen. Be instant in season, out of season. You know, if you just preach the Bible, the body is going to be edified. That's the best tip I can give any preacher. That's, that's what anybody should ever strive to do is just preach the Bible. You know, and here's the thing, guys think, well, if I fill in for preaching, you know, I got to just, I got to bring down the house. You know, I got to rock everyone's theology and just blow their minds. It's like, no, you don't. Just get up and preach what you know. Preach some simple sermon. I mean, I preached about being nice to one another this morning. Is that the most profound thing you've ever heard in your life? Oh, what a, what a radical concept. Be nice to each other. Now, maybe to some people it was. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway. I'm just saying, look, you don't have to, you can get up and preach what you know. Preach something simple. You know, preach about sin. Preach about whatever. You know, <coughs> I mean, you say, well, I don't know if I'm, I could do that. You know, it makes me nervous. <coughs> you know, I, I don't like the idea of just, you know, having to preach on a moment's notice. I want, it, I want to know how many days I'm going to have. Look, if you're going to be, if the body is going to edify, it, edify itself in love, if, if we're going to edify one another and not just me, there's going to be, have to be guys even in this room that can stand up and preach a sermon on a moment's notice. Meaning you have a sermon written with you, ready to go, and you know, preferably printed on a piece of paper, okay? I'm just throwing that out there. Have it ready. Have it in your pocket. Throw it in the pulpit. Have it in your glove box. Put it somewhere, but be ready to edify the body. Because again, it's not just about you preaching a sermon. It's about the body edifying itself, edifying one another. And I'm just trying to give us some practical ways that we can do that tonight. And say, well, I don't know. I, I just don't like that. I don't like the idea of just, you know, you having to call me, you should just, and, and me having to preach all of a sudden. Well, what's worse? Let me just, you know, and I've tried to think of a way to illustrate this, and this is the best way that I know how, okay? Imagine what would be worse. It's Sunday morning, you just, you're, you think it's a regular day, you're going to church, 
Maybe there's even going to be some visitors there. Who knows? You think it's going to be a great day at church? We're going to be preaching, soul winning? And I call. Hey, you know, whatever happened, I can't make it down there until later this afternoon. Or maybe not at all. Can you preach for me? And then, the, then uh, 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 <laughs> you know, and I've gotten that call. You know, and you're like, yes. <laughs> and you're not really sure that you can. I mean, you have a sermon, you're ready to go, but you don't really know if you can. And as terrible as that feels, imagine walking in here and seeing this. And just you sit down, and this is all you see for the rest of the service. Maybe some of you can still see me. I'm kind of big. But, <laughs> but this, I mean, what's worse? You having that being a little nervous or having an empty pulpit? I mean, people walk in, well, where's the preacher? We, have, we haven't got anybody. Well, who's going to lead the songs? Oh, we haven't got anybody. Well, who's going to preach the sermon? Well, we don't have anybody. So what are we doing here? <laughs> so be ready. You know, I'm just trying to encourage guys to preach if needed. <coughs> so the, again, edify one another. That's the title of the sermon. There's some practical ways to do that. Coming to church, participating in the program, being willing to step in where needed. You know, with the preaching, making friendships, praying for one another. Praise God, that's already happening. You know, that's something that takes place. You know, not everyone can preach. You know, we read 1 Corinthians 14. You know, the women were commanded to be in silence. So the ladies, you know, they might even be able to do a great job at it, but it's just forbidden in, the, in, the, in Scripture for them to get up and preach. It's the man's job. But hey, is that the only way you can edify somebody? No, of course not. There's other ways you can edify people. You know, by, by praying for them, talking to them, just being a friend to people. You know, that's a big, another big one. So let me just end by saying this. You know, don't bury your talents. Use them. How are you going to edify the body tonight? Use your talents that God have, has given you. If you have musical ability, are you, are you ready to, to step up or add to the music program? If you, if, if you can preach, can you, can, can you get a sermon ready just in case it's needed? You know, even if a guy came to me and said, hey, I've got a sermon, the Lord's laid something in my heart, I really want to preach it, I would even make time. I would say, you, will, you can preach some night. Uh, you know, oh, I'm not sure if I'm ready to preach, I'd like to get some practice. Well, why don't you take a service? And I, It won't even be last minute. I'll let you even pick a date. You know, we won't tell anybody else because <laughs> we want them to come back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, that's mean. But hey, don't hide your talents is what I'm saying. Don't be like that slothful servant. You know, that the Lord gave, every, gave the one guy ten talents Gave another guy two, gave another guy one. You know, the other, and when he came to, to receive that which was his, you know, they put it to usury and brought him back even more talents. Except for that wicked and slothful servant, right? He was given one talent. He just had one thing he needed to do, and he refused to do it. And what did he do? He buried it. And when the Lord come, I love that part of the story. He says this, Lo, th there thou hast that is thine. I and mean, he was so lazy, he couldn't even bring the one talent. He buried it and said, you go get it. Lo, there Thou hast that as thine. It's buried. He didn't even want to dig it up and bring it. That's how much he didn't want to do anything for God. He said, Thou art a hard man. I was afraid. You know, what is he's being slothful and he's full of excuses, right? But you know, that's not good enough. And he said, Thou wicked servant. You know, and he and rebuked him harshly. That's not, you know, the job of edifying one another falls on all of us. It's not just the preacher's job, it's everybody's job. And these are just, you know, you could probably think of other ways that you could do that. You know, not just the preaching, filling and preaching or whatever, all the things that I've talked about tonight. You could probably might even be thinking about another person or another way or another situation where you can edify the body. I mean, think about, you know, the painting that's going on here. That's going to edify the body once we get this, this place painted, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think people are going to look at that and be like, hey, that was a nice, nice thing. That is something that, that people are doing that is edifying the body. And I'm just using an example. There's so many other ways we could probably think of. You know, but the point being is this, is that God gave you a talent. You figure out what it is that you need to do to edify the body, to edify one another. Because here's the thing, if you don't do what you can do to edify the body, it's going to leave it undone. It's going to leave the body unedified in that area. So, again, it's not the job of one person. We need to edify one another. Let's go ahead and pray.